Hi everyone, I'm Nick, and this is my attempt at a hardcore Nuzlocke using only bad Pokemon. Pokemon Emerald is arguably one of the best Pokemon games ever released. I played it a bunch as a kid, but now that I'm older, there's only one thing that can come to mind. Pokemon Emerald is very easy. Emerald offers you some of the best Pokemon in the game, like Swellow, Gyarados, and Salamence. So even if you play it as a Nuzlocke, you can easily fly through the game. There are already tons of Emerald Nuzlocke on YouTube, which is why today I'll be playing a Hardcore Emerald Nuzlocke, but without all the good Pokemon. If you don't know what a Hardcore Nuzlocke is, here's my rule set. If a Pokemon faints in battle, it must be kept permanently in the box. I can only catch the first unique encounter in each area. Bag items cannot be used in battle except for Pokeballs. The game must be played on set mode. And I cannot level my Pokemon past the next gym leader's highest level Pokemon. Luckily, Emerald Trash Lock is a ROM hack already made by Pokemon Challenges. He's a Pokemon Nuzlocker with tons of Nuzlocke experience. So if you like this video and you want to see more content like this, check him out on YouTube and Twitch where he streams daily Nuzlocke content. So what is Emerald Trash Lock? Emerald Trash Lock takes the base Emerald game and removes all of the good encounters. All wild grass contain only bad Pokemon, fishing encounters have been changed, and the starters have also been replaced. This playthrough required a lot of brainstorming and strategizing, so if you want to see the behind the scenes and planning that goes into future challenges, go follow me on Twitch. I start the game and I see the professor get attacked on Route 101. Here I meet my starters, Sunkern, Slugma, and Goldeen. Now in a regular Nuzlocke, people would usually say, pick the fire starter. Fire types are rare, grass types generally don't perform well, and water types are very common, especially in Hoenn. But with starters like these, we need a closer look. I ultimately did decide that the best starter here would be Slugma, because Sunkern doesn't evolve into Sunflora until late into the game at Moss Deep City, and Goldeen seemed like a great option since water types can usually solo the first gym, except Goldeen doesn't get a water move until level 38, which is far beyond the level cap. So, Slugma was my only option. Slugma gets Yawn, Smog, and has the ability Flame Body, which is not all that bad. I picked up Slugma, and I was off on my journey. In this hack, all of the trainers and opponents will keep their regular Pokemon instead of using bad Pokemon. This means that while I was stuck using a Slugma, Mei gets to use a Mudkip. Her Mudkip was only level 5 though, and didn't know a Water-type move yet, so the first rival fight went very smoothly. On the way to Roxanne, I caught a Poochyena. Since all my opponents will be using stronger Pokemon, being able to get a free attack drop with Intimidate makes it extremely useful later on. Except Poochyena doesn't make it to the end. While I was grinding for levels, Poochyena got poison. Unlike in later gens, Gen 3 poison just faints your Pokemon. I forgot about this, and as I was walking back, Poochyena just fainted. On the next route, I caught a Wurmple. Bug Pokemon are usually underestimated because they are so weak, but many of them evolve extremely early and have a really wide move pool, especially Dustox. You can get Dustox at level 10 and it performs extremely well early game, but its usefulness will eventually fall off after a while. While I was grinding up Wurmple, I encounter a shiny Zigzagoon. Now I don't have a rule for shiny Pokemon because I never thought I would be using it in my very first video, so I just came up with one. I can use a shiny Pokemon only if it is a unique encounter. As I continue towards Roxanne, I catch a Sandshrew on Route 104, and a Weedle in Petalburg Forest. Next to Rustboro, I catch an Unknown with Hidden Power Ice, as well as an Iglybuff. I got everyone up to the level cap, and I headed towards the gym. And my video file got corrupted. I actually beat Roxanne in this attempt, but without proof to show, I just decided to reset. Attempt 2 started like Attempt 1, I picked up Slugma, defeated the rival, and got my encounters. This time, Wurmple evolves into a Beautifly, so not as useful, but still usable since it gets Absorb. On 104, I get a Hoppip, which is terrible, but it gets access to a bunch of support moves like Leech Seed and Sleep Powder, making it a bit more viable. I also catch an Iglybuff, as well as an Unknown with Hidden Power Fighting. Roxanne uses Rock Types a very defensive typing that's super effective against most of my team. Since a single rock move will do big damage, my plan was to put Geodude to sleep. This would allow me to set up defense curls on Beautifly and safely use Absorb. 
a minus six rock throw did a third of my health. Beautifly is definitely dead to an uncharmed rock throw. I switch back to Igglybuff to try and put it to sleep, but it takes too much damage. I didn't want to lose Igglybuff just yet, so I switched into Unknown and hidden powered the Geodude until it fainted. Finally, the Nose Pass. No one on my team could take a Rock Tomb, so I had to chip the Nose Pass and let Unknown die. Nose Pass hardened, and I hidden powered. He tackled, and I attacked. He ate his berry, then missed a Rock Tomb, and I attacked again. He tackled again, and I finished off the Nose Pass. I got so lucky, and somehow, I pulled through. Unknown was definitely supposed to die there, but I guess luck was just on his side. Unfortunately, as lucky as he was, I forgot to save. Now, attempt 3 actually made progress. The team going into Roxanne was Steel-type Unknown, Uchiena, Slugma, Sandshrew, Beedrill, and a Lombre. Unknown takes out the two Geodudes, and Nose Pass goes down to Lombre. An easy deathless Roxanne. From here, we can head straight towards Duford Town. I got my fishing rod and fished up a Love Disc. All fishing encounters in this game have been changed to Love Disc, so there's actually no more fishing encounters to get. On the way to Steven and Granite Cave, I caught a Rattata, eventually to be Eradicate. He won't be too useful for Brawly yet, but we're going to be using him a lot throughout this run. Guts Raticate is fast and packs some serious punch. Planning for Brawly was pretty difficult. Brawly does use fighting types, which Beedrill is 4 times resistant to. This means I could set up 6 Hardens and easily sweep my way to victory. The one problem was his Machop. It knew Seismic Toss, a move that does damage equal to the user's level. Even if I tried to set up Harden, he would take out my team before Beedrill could take him out. I sent out Sandslash to tank some hits, but instead of attacking, Machop went for Bulk Up. If Machop uses Bulk Up too many times, then he could definitely wipe my team. Hearing this, I sent out Love Disc to try and charm him down, but a single Karate Chop did most of my health. I was only able to get off one charm before switching out. I sent out Slugma to hopefully proc Flame Body or burn him with Ember. Slugma brought him down to red health, but Machop still did too much damage. I knew he would use a potion this turn, so I took the opportunity to bring out Lombre. And they actually brought each other both down to low health. Since nobody could take a hit, I had to take a risk. Machop lived with 1 HP left. It hit back with a crit low kick and knocked out Lombre. I did the calculations and 15 times out of 16, and Absorb would have taken out the Machop. I sent in Beedrill and finished him off. The rest of the fight was easy. I hardened up to 6 and Cut took care of the rest. On the way to Watson, Uchiena evolved. Mighty Yenna himself isn't too good since Dark types in this gen are special, but evolving Puchiena gives him the ability to intimidate, making him infinitely more useful. Here, there's an upcoming rival battle, but her team isn't too good yet. Radicate takes care of the Lombre, Mighty Yenna knocks out the Marsh Tomp, and Love Disc defeats the Slugma. Honestly, Mei is not that difficult in this challenge. Her team is usually pretty easy to counter. Now that we're in Mauville, we prep for Watson. Watson uses electric types, so having my now evolved Sand Slash is amazing. He doesn't learn any ground moves, but Watson can't really hurt him. Sand Slash easily takes out the Voltorb and Electric, but next comes out Magneton. I wanted Sand Slash to be healthy for Magnetric, so I sent out Slugma to Ember away the Magneton. Now against just Magnetric, I sent out Sand Slash to take a Shockwave, and we easily defeat Watson. My next encounter was a Sableye in Meteor Falls. In Gen 3, where fairy types don't exist, having a Pokemon with no weaknesses is amazing, especially for stalling. I make my way towards Flannery, and on the way, there's a boss fight with Maxi on Mount Chimney. His team isn't too scary. He starts out with a Mightyena, so Twin Needle from Beedrill easily takes it out. Next is a Camerot. I send in Mightyena to get off and intimidate and go for Bite. Somehow, I get three flinches in a row to take out the Camerot. His last Pokemon was a Zubat, so Sandslash had no problem taking it out. The final encounter before Flannery was a cast form on Jagged Pass. Probably the best encounter for Flannery. She likes to set up Sunny Day, and all of her team has Overheat, a move that can do big damage in the sun, but cast form can counter her team by setting up a Rain Dance and using a Water-type Weather Ball. Her first Pokemon is Nummel. Since Nummel is slower than cast form and always goes for a Sunny Day first, 
I used the first turn to chip her down with a water gun. This way, on the next turn, I could set up Rain Dance while tanking a hit. The plan worked perfectly. Rain boosted Weather Ball swept her entire team. The next gym leader, Norman, happens right after the Flannery fight. Norman uses normal types, and he's known for having a powerful slacking, but his scarier team members are actually Spinda and Vigoroth. I PP stall the Spinda out of Teeter Dances so that Sableye can't be confused out against the slacking. But he sends out Vigoroth, who has Feign Attack, a move that can two-shot Sableye. Here, I switch to Cast Form to tank the Feign Attack and defeat the Vigoroth. He next sends out Linoon, which is fast and always goes for Belly Drum. Luckily, it only knows normal type damaging moves, so Sableye can't be touched. Last out was his slacking. Sableye actually learns Detect by level up, so I can stall the slacking's attacking turn and defeat it with little to no risk. With Norman out of the way, we get the Surf HM. Surf allows us to access a huge part of the map and gives us a bunch of encounters. In Petalburg, I got a Masquerade with Intimidate, a Pelipper in Slateport, and a Porygon in New Mothville. I also find a Meryl with huge power on Route 108. The next destination is Fortree City with a pit stop at the Weather Institute. On the way, I caught a Mankey and a Surviper. We come up against a series of Aqua Grunt battles at the Weather Institute, but all they use are Poison and Dark types, so they really weren't difficult to handle. There's another rival fight before reaching Fortree City, but May really isn't a problem. Now it's time for Winona, the hardest gym leader yet. Winona isn't stacked in terms of team composition, but she does have some hard Pokemon to go up against. She has a Swablu and a Tropius, but problems really come from the rest of her team. Pelipper and Skarmory are extremely bulky and can take a lot of hits before going down, and her Altaria is built for offense. I didn't have the best encounters to go up against her, so my plan had to be perfect. She starts with Swablu and Tropius, which are easily handled by Baltoy and Saviper, but then comes out Altaria. The strategy was to pivot into Baltoy to take an Earthquake so that I could switch to Kecleon and Screech her down. But when switching to Kecleon, she goes for Dragon Dance instead of an attacking move. I knew if she set up any more Dragon Dances, I would get swept. So I tried slashing down the Altaria, which reaches red health. This got Winona to heal, and now up against a healthy Altaria at plus 4 attack, it took my entire team to take her out. By the time Pelipper came in, my whole team was either dead or under half health. Eventually, the Pelipper and Skarmory did knock out the rest of my team. Castform did come close to knocking out the Skarmory, but it survived in red health and knocked out Castform. Attempt 3 wipes to Winona. Attempt 4 didn't make it too far. I lost to the rival battle after Roxanne. I let the Torkoal set up too many curses, and it just swept my team. On to attempt 5. Since most of the early battles are either really repetitive or really easy, I'll make them short and only concentrate on the important parts. Roxanne was an easy sweep by Beautifly. Absorb takes out the two Geodudes, and I send out Igglybuff to charm down the nose pass. This way, a Poison Powder from Hoppip gives us the first badge. One down, seven to go. On the rival fight after Roxanne, Beautifly accidentally died to a buy from Mudkip. Unfortunate since I wasn't paying attention, but Beautifly doesn't get much use after this, so this isn't the worst loss. In Duford, I catch a Love Disc as well as another Rattata. Now for Brawly. Slugma takes care of the Machop. I tried to yawn the Metatite to sleep, but a Focus Punch KO'd Slugma. See ya, you didn't last too long. I send out Skiploom to sleep powder the Metatite while it goes for a Reflect and allow me to set up Hardens on Beedrill. Hut defeated the Metatite and Makuhita, earning us the second badge. Two down, six to go. Watson took some planning, but we were able to get out mostly unscathed. Voltorb and Electric went down to a Hyper Fang from Raticate, but Magneton was much more difficult. Since I didn't have a Ground or Fire type, it resisted all of my attacks. I was able to get off a Leech Seed from Skiploom to get some consistent damage, and I finished it off with Beedrill so that I could be in to chip away at the main trick. I got off a Crit Twin Needle, but Minectric has a Citrus Berry, and Shockwave lowered my health much more than I expected. I knew Butterfree could take a non-crit Shockwave, so putting Minectric to sleep was my next plan of action. Surprisingly, he went for a Thunder Wave on my already slower Butterfree, so I got off the Sleep Powder for free. At this point, I was feeling pretty good. I send in Mighty Yenna to finish the battle since Butterfree is way too valuable to risk. The only thing that could mess me up was for Minectric to wake up and crit a Shockwave.
Critical Shockwave kills Mariana. This is why you always have to play around crits. I am now in a really bad situation. My entire team is slower due to paralysis, and they're all dead to a crit shockwave. Raticate might be able to kill Minectric, but I don't know if it's fast enough. So I send in Butterfree, and I just have to play into the critical. Thankfully, Sleep Powder hits. We're still not safe yet though. If Minectric wakes up next turn, or when I go for the kill, then we can still lose. I switch to Radicate, and he stays asleep. I click Strength, and I pray he doesn't wake up. Watson is defeated. Three down, five left. Flannery is actually a bit scary this time, since I don't have a cast form. This means I can't set up rain, and Flannery can do a lot with overheat damage. The team going in was Love Disc, Machoke, Meow, Radicate, Apom, and Butterfree. Butterfree is here for fast sleep powders. Machoke I caught as a Guts Machop on Route 112, and Meow and Apom are here just for sacrifice. He starts with Nummel, and I start with Love Disc. Love Disc is faster, so I take out the Nummel one shot. She then brings out Slugma. Slugma actually takes three water guns before going down, so she's able to get off a light screen and a sunny day. Next, Flannery sends out Camrot. Water gun only does about a quarter, but she goes for tackles, which don't do a lot of damage. Once light screen wears off, Water gun finishes off the Camrot. We're doing well so far. It's just Torko left, and I have a full team and a half health love disc. The sun is over, so I take the opportunity to chip the Torkoal. I sack Apom and Meowth to tank the overheat damage, and I let them die because I want Torkoal's special attack to drop. This lets me safely bring out Butterfree and Sleep Powder the Torkoal for free. I switch back to Love Disc, and Water Gun brings the Torkoal down to red health as it wakes up and sets up another sun. I know she heals next turn, so I go for the chip damage with another Water Gun, and I switch to Machoke to take a Body Slam. Here, I was dead to a regular overheat, but since she was at minus two special attack, I decided to stay in and low kick. I did get some big damage, but he lived and got the kill on Machoke. Raticate comes in on the free switch, and Strength finishes off the Torkoal, earning us the fourth badge. I completely forgot she had the White Herb. When I calculated for overheat damage, I forgot to remove the stack change. Really unfortunate since Machoke would have been crucial in Norman's gym. Before going to Norman, May gives me the Go Goggles, so I head to Route 111 and catch myself a Sand Slash. Since I got the Dig TM right beside Fall Arbor Town, Sand Slash is my answer to slacking. I start the Norman fight with Butterfree against Spinda. Butterfree puts Spinda to sleep, so Spinda goes down quite easily. Next, Norman sends out Vigoroth, which can't be put to sleep due to Vital Spirit, so I switch out into the Maw while I caught. Vigoroth can't touch Mawile, so he also goes down quite easily. Next out is the slacking. I try going for the slow baton pass to let Mawile tank a hit, but somehow Mawile outsped. Thankfully, he tried to use counter, so I could time my digs and easily take out slacking. Last up is Linoon. Linoon always goes for belly jump first turn, so two strengths grants us the victory. Finally, an easy gym battle. Now with Norman defeated, we can use Surf outside of battle. I actually missed a couple of encounters last time we were at this point. One of the possible encounters they could get us was Remoraid. Remoraid learns Aurora Beam by level up, which is an ice type move. This will allow us to hit Winona's Altaria for super effective damage. I accidentally skipped it the last time we were here because I didn't go to all the possible Surf spots. Along with the now evolved Octillery, I also bring in a Voltorb I found on Jagged Pass, and a Plusle I found on 120. I wanted to take out the Altaria as early as possible when my team was still healthy. I decided to lead with Plusle to bait Winona into using her Altaria second. Plusle starts the battle and Spark one-shots her Swablu. She then sends in her Altaria just as expected. I could pivot to Pelipper to resist the Earthquake, and then send an Octillery on a weaker Dragon Breath, but I was afraid she would set up Dragon Dances instead of going for the kill like last time. I hard switched into Octillery, and sure enough, she goes for the Dragon Dance. Aurora Beam does 3 quarters of her health, as she goes for another Dragon Dance, and luckily, a Berry keeps her out of potion range. 
Octillery tanks the plus 2 Earthquake and knocks out Altaria with the next Aurora Beam. Her next Pokemon was Tropius. Tropius will either go for a Solar Beam or try to get off a Sunny Day, but either way, she can't hit me this turn. I hit her with Aurora Beam and it leaves her with 1 HP. I swap into Electro to tank the incoming Solar Beam, and he sweeps the rest of the gym. Skarmory goes down to a Spark, and so does Pelipper, earning us the 6th badge. I make my way towards Lily Cove City, where we do a bunch of story stuff, and clear through Team Magma Hideout. I easily wipe through all the grunts, and head straight towards Maxi. Maxi actually has a decent team this time. His team is Mighty Yenna, Camrock, and a Crobat. I start with Stantler to get off and intimidate on Mighty Yenna. I then immediately switch into Beedrill, who takes out Mighty Yenna with Swagger Twin Needles. I switch out into the Azumarill I got in Petalburg City, as he brings out his Camerupt, and Surf takes him out. Last out is Crobat. Crobat is surprisingly bulky, but he goes down to 3 Surfs. Alright, I take it back. Maxi is still hot garbage. With Maxi defeated, we go on to clear out Aqua Hideout and access a huge part of the map. This next phase of the game gives us a total of 14 new encounters. Here's some of what we got. Of course we got many water types that you can expect from surfing on water routes. But we also caught some bird Pokemon like Fero and Noctowl. Kate and Liza were pretty hard to plan for. All my dark types are physical attackers, and they use some of the bulkiest psychic types in Solrock, Lunatone, and Claydol but they do share a common water weakness, which we have plenty of. The plan that I came up with was to Surf Sweep with our Water Mons. In Generation 3, Surf doesn't hit your ally Pokemon. This plan was near perfect. All my Water Mons are faster and they can hit hard enough to sweep the gym. The one problem is Sunny Day. Both Zatu and Solrock know Sunny Day, so if they set up the sun, we won't be dealing enough damage. To work around this issue, I'm going to be starting the battle with Raticate and Crawdont. Crawdont knows Taunt, which forces the opponent into only using attacking moves. Raticate Facade and Crawdont's Taunt will both go into the Zatu. Since Raticate can one-shot Zatu, haunting the Zatu slot into the incoming Pokemon allows us to predict their next move. Once Zatu goes down, Lunatone comes in. Haunting the Lunatone guarantees that Psychic goes into Raticate. After tanking the Earthquake from Claydol, I immediately switch into Mantine who is extremely specially bulky. They do manage to get a Psychic crit, getting Mantine to low health, but Pelipper comes in and Surf sweeps their team. We easily could have lost Mantine there because I didn't calculate the critical ranges, but we would have won for sure. My team was stacked with water Pokemon so there was no way we could have lost. After the 7th gym is an Aqua Grunt cleaning. Here, Archie is supposed to be a boss battle, but my Plusle and Electrode easily take out the trash. Archie, you're worse than Maxi. Once all the story stuff is over, you know, meeting Wallace, finding Rayquaza, settling the global warfare, we can finally go on to challenge Juan. Now, I didn't record all of this Juan fight, but Juan was a cakewalk. Electrode can answer all of Juan's team except for Whiskash. Electrode Spark takes out the Love Disk, and then he sends out Whiskash. I switch into Mantine to tank the incoming Earthquake, and Rain Boosted Surf easily defeats Whiskash. Electrode comes back in, and Thunder in Rain easily sweeps the rest of Juan's team. We're on to the Elite Four. Just as I enter Victory Road, Wally challenges us to a battle. This Wally fight can be a little difficult if you don't know what's coming, but I was more than prepared. Altaria goes down to an Ice Beam from Glalie, and Delcaddy goes down to Electrode. Wally sends out Magneton, so I bring Glalie back in to use Ice Beam. Roselia goes down to an Ice Beam as well, and Gardevoir dies to the Sableye I caught in the Cave of Origins. Honestly, in my opinion, Wally is not a good rival. I get that he's supposed to be an inexperienced trainer like us, but seriously? Delcaddy? Roselia? I use them because I have to, but you don't. I navigate through Victory Road, and I head to the Elite Four. Now, this Elite Four can be pretty difficult. Twitch Chat and I spent minutes brainstorming ideas. Here's what we came up with. First is Sydney. The first Elite Four. Should be easy, right? 
I start with Sableye to take the Intimidate and to bait Crunches into Raticate. This way, once I switch, Raticate won't take as much damage. Okay, Raticate can't stay out for too long then. Facade takes out Mightyena and Shiftry, but we have to switch out on Cacturn. Pidgeot comes in, and Fly takes out the Cacturn. Sydney then sends out an Absol that knows Rock Slide. So, I switch into Azu to take a hit, and Absol goes for Sword Stance, but a Crit Surf prevents it from setting up on us. Last is Crawdont, but Thunderbolt from Electrode easily takes it out. Took some work to get past Sydney. Hopefully Phoebe goes well too. Unlike Sydney, we can't rely on Facade since Phoebe uses Ghost types. However, Raticate learns Shadow Ball by TM, and Ghost types in this generation are physical moves, meaning we can still use Guts to our advantage. Phoebe starts with a Dusclops that knows Curse and Confuse Ray. Raticate can't one-shot the Dusclops, so Sableye takes care of it instead. Her next Pokemon was Bayonet, so I switch into Raticate. Bayonet goes for a Will-O-Wisp, but since Raticate's already poisoned, her Will-O-Wisp fails. I take out the Bayonet with a Shadow Ball and Sableye comes out next. Shadow Ball doesn't kill, so Sableye lives and uses a double team. Here, I make the dumbest decision I could have ever done. I click Shadow Ball, risking the miss. Thankfully, I didn't get punished. Shadow Ball finishes Sableye as well as the next Bayonet. Her last Pokemon to come out is Dusclops. Here, I'm dead to an Earthquake, and Shadow Ball can't one-shot the Dusclops. I switch into Azu to chip the Dusclops, and Azu takes too much damage, so I switch back into Sableye and finish off the Dusclops. Not the cleanest victory, but I'll certainly take it. Third Elite Four is Glacia. She's probably the easiest out of the four, Guts Facade Raticate one-shots her two Celios and her two Glalies. Honestly, I don't know what I would do without Raticate. He seems to be sweeping through everything at this point. Walrein, however, can tank a Facade. I pivot into Azu to bring out Electrode safely. Thunderbolt easily finishes the Walrein, defeating Glacia. Apparently, if the AI doesn't see a super effective move against your lead Pokemon, they'll just send in their team in the order they're listed in their party. This means that Eradicate was guaranteed to sweep most of her team while ensuring that Walrein came out last. Finally, it's time for Drake, the last Elite Four member, the Dragon-type Specialist. He should be incredibly difficult, right? No, he's not. He really isn't. I start out with Eradicate, and Guts Facade takes out all of his team except for Salamence who comes out last. Again, since the AI has no super effective moves against Eradicate, Drake is guaranteed to send out Salamence last. I pivot into Azu and Ice Beam defeats Salamence. Now, with the Elite Four out of the way, there is one obstacle left in front of us. Now you might be wondering, why was it so hard to plan? Raticate swept most of the Elite Four, and Electron and Azu cleaned up behind him. Well, Wallace actually has a pretty decent team of water Pokemon. Whizcash completely walls Electrode. His Swift Swim Ludicolo is really bulky and loves to set up double team. His Tentacruel is really fast, and Intimidate from Gyarados prevents Raticate from dealing enough damage. In order to get around Wallace, I plan to play hyper aggressively, sacking my team members once they serve their purpose. Wallace by far took the most planning, and the team was specifically designed to counter his. Wallace leads Waylord, and I lead Raticate. Asad takes out the Waylord according to plan. I knew I had to sack Raticate at some point because eventually it'll die to poison, so I plan for Wallace as if I didn't have Raticate on my team at all. Next, he sends out Tentacruel, another easy one shot by Raticate. Out next is Ludicolo, another one shot by Raticate. Whiskash comes out, and again, Asad one hits. This is going surprisingly well. I didn't actually calculate whether or not Raticate could kill any of those mons because I plan to sack her to the second team member. Gyarados comes out, and Intimidate means that Facade won't one-shot. Raticate, your time has come. Raticate goes down, and out comes Electrode. Thunderbolt takes out Gyarados, and out comes his last Pokémon, Milotic. 
Electro Thunderbolt does about half. At this point, I was more than certain I would win, so I wanted to go out with a bang. Emerald Trash Lock has been complete. This was an insane run. Definitely one of the hardest challenges I've ever done, but it was so fun to play. There were many fights that got me to think of crazy unique strategies and forced me to adapt on the fly. This hack balanced the low quality encounters by giving you a huge variety of Pokemon to use. But maybe next time, I would consider banning Raticate. Without a doubt, Raticate is the MVP of this challenge. I definitely could have played some areas better, but for my first ROM hack Nuzlocke, I'd say I did okay. If you enjoyed watching this, please like the video and subscribe. Drop a comment if you thought of a better strategy that could have made some fights easier. Let me know how I could have played better. If you have any ideas on what I should do for my next challenge, let me know as well. I'll look at the comments to get some inspiration. But until next time, thanks for watching.